Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the webinar from the Council on Foundations and the National Council of Nonprofits, ARPA and Philanthropy, Seizing the Once-in-a-Generation Opportunity. I will now turn it over to David Cass, Vice President for Government and Legal Affairs, Legal Resources at the Council on Foundations. Thanks so much, Caroline. Uh, well, welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, so last year, Congress passed the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, to help communities respond to the coronavirus pandemic. And in that bill, we're gonna talk about the $350 billion that is available for states, local, tribal, and territorial governments. So there are three things we wanna to try to accomplish today. So first is to, just brief you on what the funds are for and how to influence how the funds are spent. And then we're also gonna uh, discuss just some examples of, of some of your colleagues who have been working on this. And then just open it up for questions. You know, what, what any questions you have about how to participate in this really once in a generation opportunity. So um, I'm very excited. We've, we've worked very closely with the National Council on Nonprofits for many years. They do terrific work. And so with us, we have uh, David Thompson, who's the Vice President of Public Policy there, and Tiffany Carter, who's their Policy Counsel. So um, I, why don't I turn it over to David? Um, oh, oh, and I'm, I'm, I should also say then, uh, Alyssa Gordon is gonna be speaking afterwards. She's the VP of Community Impact, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, and, and Marianne uh, Klaus, who is the uh, Associate Director for Community Leadership at the Parkersburg Area Community Foundation and Regional Affiliate. So with that, let me turn it over to, to David. Oh, you're on mute, David. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yep, yep. Great, and hopefully you can see my slides, the way my screens are set up, it's kind of hard to tell when you can and when you can't. I'm yep, David we Thompson. got your slides. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm David Thompson with the National Council of Nonprofits. My colleague, Tiffany Gorley Carter, is joining us from Rwanda tonight. Uh, or today. Uh, another of our colleagues, Jessica Mindieto, was planning to uh, join us as well, but is ill today. So fortunately, we uh, are all committed and passionate about the American Rescue Plan Act, but I want to change one item on the opening slide, and that is that people my age, which is older than most on the call, this isn't a once in a generation, this is once in a lifetime opportunity. In my career, I've never seen anything this robust and this helpful to the ability of charitable nonprofits and philanthropy to fix things. Uh, I'll give you a visual. The American Rescue Plan Act and particularly the state and local funds take away the favorite go-to argument from government, as in stop right there. We don't have the money for what it is you want to do, so no need talking about it. They've taken the hand away and now the money is available. There is money available. The problem is it's not earmarked or directly state, uh, directed to us. We're going to talk about uh, a number of topics, but first I want to let you remind you, if you don't know already, National Council of Nonprofits is made up primarily of state associations of nonprofits. So your community foundations hopefully are already working very closely with the state associations in your states or in your regions. And I want to encourage you, if you're not already, to please reach out. If you don't know who to call, let us know. We can connect you. If you're already working with them and they're not paying attention to you, let us know and we'll see what we can do to help there. The community foundations and philanthropy working closely with state associations is how the work gets done. So we wanted to put that slide there just to remind you and to encourage uh, greater interaction. David said we're covering three things. Uh, Tiffany and I will cover three topics. One is just the background on the American Rescue Plan Act, identifying some things that, that governments and nonprofits ought to know, and then focusing on the opportunities for philanthropic engagement. And Tiffany and I will tag team on these issues. First, the American Rescue Plan Act itself. It put out David uh, earlier, David Cass earlier mentioned that is $350 billion. That's that last blue item down at the bottom of the line, it, uh, or the bottom of the checks. The bill itself, the law itself, generated, uh, 
provided funding of $1.9 billion for a wide variety of programs, projects, things that maybe your community foundations or maybe some of the foundations in your community uh, have as their focus areas. So there's a lot of money available through the federal agencies for block grants to the local governments or economic development administration. The current head of that, Assistant Secretary, came from the YWCA movement, so she very much understands the nonprofit community, the substance abuse, homelessness, wide variety of things that we're not really going to focus on, but we want to alert you up front that these are great opportunities of using the American Rescue Plan Act, creating its funding streams that you may have had the hand in the past told there's no money for that. There is now, and hopefully uh, you and your, your colleagues can take full advantage. Our primary focus today, though, is on the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. And Tiffany, would you go off camera or off uh, mic and, and tell everybody, what, it, what is it our friends in Alaska call that? It's called the sizzle furf. And we say it just because it's a really fun word to say. Alaska came up with it, so we give them the credit, but we try to say it as often as possible. We want to tap into the sizzle furf. It's the cool word that all the cool kids are saying on the street. So sizzle furf it is. So if there's a pop quiz or extra credit, that's that's the uh, pronunciation. Uh, the Cecil for the uh, this special provision in the law provides nearly 200 billion for state governments, 65. You see the numbers there. All of this money should have been sent to the recipients by now. It was rolled out at different levels at different speeds over the last 18 months, but it all should be out by now to the governments and, and, and the entities. I can't guarantee it. There may be some glitches along the way, but they should either, they, all of them should have the money. They should have already figured out how they're going to spend it and they should be well on their way. That's not really the case. The law itself, uh, this is the timeline you need to know. Some states, some cities claim they've already spent all the money. They're probably not fully expressing the truth on that matter. They may have uh, decided where they're going to spend it. The legislature, the city council may have written up a plan or something, but the money probably has not gotten into the bank accounts of the recipients yet. Uh, the This is the schedule as of now. That uh, exact, there are rules in place. There, uh, the regulations are in place. And actually, this is very, very quickly, this is a, an advocacy story. When they first came out with regulations in May 10th, 2022, they forgot nonprofits. They had the word nonprofit in once, but they forgot us. And state and local governments around the country were saying, no, nope, we can't grant, provide grants to nonprofits because these regulations don't say so. And the nonprofit community advocated their hearts out and fixed the regulations. So it is now abundantly clear that the statute itself and the regulations state that charitable nonprofits are eligible for CISL for funds. It's written in the statute, it's written in the regulations. Don't let anyone tell you, no, we can't, because yes, you can. yes, they can. So we are eligible. The reason for this webinar is that we are not entitled. We're not guaranteed these funds. So it's taking a group effort from all of us to get this done. Uh, the money has to be obligated two years from uh, December. So we, they have two more years to obligate the funds, and then they have two years after that to spend them. That's a correction from, remember during the coronavirus, during the CARES Act, they put out some money to the state and local governments with some very quick deadlines, and the states were afraid that they're going to have to send the money back or claw back from nonprofits and so forth, they fix that problem. So there is time to be smart. There's time to accomplish things. The statute said that there are three things you can't, they can't do, state, local, tribal, territorial governments. Three things they can't do. They can't use the money to pay down their un, um, underfunded public pension plans. They can't use the money for tax cuts and they can't use the money just to put it, sock it away in the rainy day fund. The tax cut issue is a very hot legislative issue. This morning I was reading the, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals said that the refused to reverse an Alabama case that said uh, the law was vague or the, the, um, the states do have the authority to do tax cuts. 
that's a challenge in that that could siphon off money away from the needed work that philanthropy and charitable nonprofits know are needed in, in the communities. But the point is that they can't spend it on those three things, but just about it, every reasonable thing that they want to and that you can talk them into, they can spend the money on. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. So, and Eva, we see your question about being an intermediary. We're going to get to that in a second. So hold on to that question. But what we really want to talk about to set the scene is where community foundations, where philanthropy fits in to how these funds are being obligated. And so whenever this ARPA was approved, all this money came out, this $1.9 trillion, and they broke it down into all these different buckets. So they broke it down to like education, they broke it down to healthcare, we broke it into coronavirus vaccination, things like that. The good news about it is that it made it so that we aren't all fighting for the same pie, right? Like they made different pies, which is completely unheard of in the nonprofit sector whenever we're talking about federal and state funding. Whenever, whenever this passed in 2021, at the beginning of the year, we created um, a, a template, a booklet for governments and nonprofits to be able to work together and see how this funding can go out into the communities. Because we didn't want all this money to just sit in you know, the state coffers. We didn't want it to get caught up in red tape at congressional level. So we created this, um, this, this roadmap for lack of a better term, on how government officials and charitable nonprofits could work together. And then we started hearing back from nonprofits saying, you know what, government just doesn't really know what they're doing. We really need to work with groups that we've already worked with who know how to work with nonprofits. And those groups are philanthropy, community foundations, private mm -hmm. foundations, groups that have applications understand that nonprofits don't have owners, like really basic things that the government groups just didn't get. So we created a third edition of this um, uh, report, Strengthening State and Local Economies in Partnership with Nonprofits, specifically to include philanthropy. So next slide. So the question is, where does philanthropy fit in whenever it comes to charitable nonprofits? Well, you are a nonprofit, and so you can be both a recipient and a provider of relief. And that and was really, really key that we actually went back to Congress, we went back to the rulemaking saying, can you please clarify this? And so this goes to your question, Eva, on whether you're an intermediary or a subgrant grantee. And the, the answer is you can be both. And so if you're coming from, um, if you're, you're going to receive this from some government entity, because all the money goes to a government entity, but then you can be a subgrantee that then provides it out further so the charitable nonprofit, the frontline nonprofit can be the recipient or um, you could be the provider of relief. So we can, we can hash that out more if you need more clarification, but the answer is both. Next slide. And so in this report, we wanted to make it really clear on how to guide charitable nonprofits, government officials, Philanthropy, philanthropy and philanthropic serving organizations on how to think about where this money should be spent and what should be um, prioritized. So we wanted equity to, be, equity to be the number one point that people should be thinking about. Organizations, groups that have been left out, things on um, underserved communities, black um, people of color led organizations, minority led organizations, uh, women-led organizations, organizations with uh, maybe a person with a disability, they should be thought of whenever um, this money is going out the door. And so we wanted to clarify that right from the beginning, make sure that you had that lens. And then we wanted to clarify for government officials who just don't think about nonprofits ever when it comes to the economy, right? That nonprofits are economic multipliers. You give the money to the arts, you give the money to um, certain, you know, basic foundations in the organization, in, in the communities, and that money will be spread. We kept hearing about all this red tape. We kept hearing about, you know, we know this money exists. We know that it's sitting in this specific fund in the legislature, but then they're asking for all these questions that don't even apply to nonprofits, and therefore we're being left out. And so we were saying you should be quick, you should be 
fair, you should be efficient, you don't need to have a 40 page uh, questionnaire or application for like a $10,000 grant that's just not worth the nonprofit's time. So we laid that out with best practices. And then we said, you know, even doing that, you can still be accountable and transparent. And so in this report, we really break down how to think about this funding when it comes to the best uses in getting out into the communities themselves. Next. And so this, you know, we set this all up. So by the time we're here, we've already talked about eligibility criteria, allowable uses, things that community foundations, private foundations go through all the time, right? Like you have program administrators, you have application requirements with nonprofits and already know how we run, know how we function, know what is capable versus just you know, excess time for unnecessary questioning. Those are, those are the things that we really pressed on governments. And that's what we need now philanthropy and um, community foundations to step into and say, yes, we can take this over and know how this can be done. Next. And I don't know if you can hear my, uh, I have a child who it might be screaming in the background. So I apologize for that, but I think, I think she's calming down. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who did that? So um, I'm going to turn this back over to David. So this is what we did. So that was kind of the lead up between 2021 and 2022, now that we're going into fall. And so we were able to collect a whole bunch of examples of philanthropy working with frontline nonprofits, working with government, stepping in and making use of these best practices. Um, I think the biggest aha moment that I had was I was talking uh, the governor's office of Ohio just called us up randomly and said we have this money we don't know what to do with it we don't know how to get it out in the communities the best way possible and we had already heard from all, all these um, organizations saying just work with philanthropy work with community foundations they already know and it was a huge aha moment because it was able to take off a burden of government hand it over to people who already knew what to do and um, then pass that money through in a much easier way. So David, what other examples do you have? Oh, uh, way too many to uh, dig in here. They are, we do have them in the reports, but advancing equity in terms of bringing people, making governments, making sure that they have a larger pool of applicants for the various grant programs. We've been pushing things beyond just, you're a victim of the pandemic, your revenues are down, here's a pot of money. Going be, that's worthwhile, that's needed for a lot of organizations, but going beyond to recognize government, you don't need to go hire a whole bunch of social workers. You can turn to your local nonprofits, hire them to do that. Uh, so that it's be creative with solutions, things that you've been wanting to do all along, but didn't have the funds. My favorite example uh, is in New York City. The state had uh, shortchanged nonprofits on reimbursements for government grants and contracts. The city of New York said, nuts to that, that's wrong. And they actually used ARPA funds to pay the indirect costs of nonprofits in the states. The city had made the promise and they lived up to the promise using ARPA funds. That means that down the road, there may be some challenges, but for the time being, the, the government, the nonprofits were not having to subsidize government by uh, through their indirect costs. Uh, We've already run uh, a little bit long. I'm going to walk in. This is, in my mind, this is the main point of the show. So I'm going to uh, walk over the, the Q&A time uh, to discuss specifically the roles of philanthropy. This is what we've been hearing from others. Uh, the Hartford Foundation did some excellent work that uh, Alyssa will be discussing. So I won't go uh, into much detail on that. But from the nonprofit perspective, so I, yes, I recognize I'm talking to funders saying you should fund this and that. Okay, never goes over well. What we've experienced, what we've learned from talking with our own fund, uh, foundation partners and colleagues and people working closely with their state associations are these three main areas. Now, uh, philanthropy as funders, philanthropy as administrators, and philanthropy as conveners. As funders, it's there are two different ways. We've seen great examples of foundations working with the local government to do matching grants, the foundation, the foundation is focused on affordable housing. They're already putting money into it. 
I've talked to the local government to spending, putting money into the project the foundation was pushing all along. So that there's using these funds to build the public-private partnerships that should be going forward before, but the government said, we don't have the funds. They do. But my, I have several favorite examples, but my favorite example in terms of indirect support is capacity building grants. A lot of state associations do this. A lot of community foundations may do this. We have a serious problem that lots of nonprofits, particularly those run by Black and Indigenous and people of color and in rural areas, have never had a government grant before, don't know where to apply, don't know how to account for it, don't know how to keep their record books. Capacity building training targeted to organizations that have been left out of government grants, left out of the action in the past, creating programs to change that, to overcome the uh, past problems, past shortcomings, strikes me as a great idea. Administrators, you're already doing it. Many of you are already in administrators. The question before is when the community foundation is an administrator. Uh, you, are an inter you are an intermediary. My, uh, to directly answer the question, my understanding is that you have to spend that money. It's obligated now. If they've sent you the money, it's obligated now. And it, you have to get it out the, of out the door by... October by uh, December 31st, 2026. That's my understanding. I have to check the regs again, but it's very clearly written in the regs. You guys are better at working with nonprofits, identifying problems. I'm hoping that from this call and from uh, any other engagement you have, you tell governments, yo, we are we already have the experts in town. Work work with the community foundations, and all of our state associations have been delivering that message as well. And then finally, as conveners, there's the reality. There's a power dynamic. If you, if, if I ask the mayor to get together to come here from nonprofits as to why they ought to, why the government ought to spend uh, ARPA money on nonprofits, I'm going to get ignored. If you do it and you bring in several mayors from the region, you bring in nonprofits, it's going to have a healthy dialogue. It's just the human nature and realities. And you have the opportunity to bring the community together, whether it's a survey, whether it's a town hall meeting, anything along those lines that you can set up. We can try. We're not going to get the attendance. So um, using your convener power may cost you some, uh, some muffins and some coffee, but the impact could be significant because it redirects the attention away from whatever the politicians want into what the community needs, which is where you and we combined can uh, work things out. All right, David, I walked over it a little bit, but um, are there questions we need to cover? So would welcome people's questions uh, for uh, David and Tiffany, and then uh, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna hear from our colleagues from the community foundations and have more time for Q&A, but just, uh, are there any questions specifically about what David and Tiffany cover? So I can, I'll take uh, Mindy's question here about local governments being very conservative in their interpretation. So we've heard that as well. The good news is inside the regs, they actually lay out all the different things that apply under this terms of COVID or COVID related. And the things that apply are very, very broad. So things like transportation, um, loss, like, Lost employees. Uh, there's a there's a pretty good range, and we lay those out in the report. So you can just like copy and paste portions of the report, and then you can take the um, examples as well and say like this local government defined COVID related as opening up a community like a community area or food uh, food security or whatever, and just use it. I think the big thing that we're seeing is that um, it has to be, you just kind of have to own it and say it with authority when it comes to the local government and they, they've been backing down because COVID related has been so broadly defined. We have seen every, it's, it's black and white and every shade of gray has been interpreted by local governments. Louisville, Kentucky was particularly bad. Rhode Island was particularly bad saying, no, we can't provide grants to charitable nonprofits. Uh, we saw that many local governments, and many, I agree with you, they're, they're being extremely conservative. Many local governments don't get grants from the federal government, so they are skittish. Um, and the regulations do say that they can spend up to $10 million 
just putting it back into their treasuries. So if they only get 10 million, that's not much of an opportunity. But we, we heard a variety of things like, oh, we have to follow the federal rules and you must spend the money and then we will reimburse you later. The federal rules were abundantly clear. Beat the cities over the head with the reaction. We're not requiring that. You can do the money up front, and that makes perfect sense to the federal government. So in the regulations, they tried to identify specific misinterpretations or uh, intentional uh, fuzziness in the minds of the local officials. Um, and they, they went out of their way, and they will do frequently asked questions. And as we collectively identify additional misinterpretations, we have the opportunity to go back to Treasury. Treasury recognized they got it wrong the first time. They fixed everything that we told them. We collectively, the nonprofit community, told them was wrong, and they will fix more as we identify more. So please keep the questions coming. And hopefully, Eva, I answered your question that I believe it's obligate, uh, the money to use obligated until spent by December 31st, 2026. Any other questions folks have before we turn to Alyssa and Marianne? All right. Well, um, why don't I turn it over to Alyssa? Um, and uh, she's going to tell us about their experience. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, and um, we are the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving is the community foundation for the 29 town. Uh, region in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. And um, we, we can go to the first slide, I think. Thank you. So when, as soon as we started to hear about this, this ARPA possibility, um, the ARPA uh, program, we made a decision to commission some research, um, working with both a national um, consultant as well as a local policy um, outfit here in Connecticut to uh, interview state, municipal, and school district leaders uh, here in Connecticut, as well as our community foundation peers to understand what folks were beginning to think about and the planning that they were beginning to have um, in response to this unprecedented influx of federal dollars, uh, inclusive of ARPA, but we were also looking at the other type of COVID uh, recovery funds that were, were trickling into the state. And much of what we learned um, from this research in which we published a report, and I have the link here, and I, I believe it will end up being shared after the webinar today. So much of what we learned um, you know, was highlighted by Tiffany and David uh, in, in their conversation. Um, but a, a couple of things that, that I'll just lift up is that for us, uh, the way we approached the research was it really was interviews, interviews with mayors, with superintendents, uh, with statewide policymakers, executive agency leadership, um, which really allowed us to have a level of granularity, um, uh, um, which permitted us to crosswalk our own grant making allocation and projections um, against what, what uh, the public sector leaders were thinking about. Um, and that was immensely useful because it meant that we um, wouldn't be necessarily supplanting public dollars, that we could identify early on opportunities to influence and leverage uh, the plans uh, for the public dollars. Um, and it also helped us think about how we could uh, help have conversations to influence attention to be paid, um, as Tiffany and David mentioned, to strengthening and ensuring that there would be um, a racial ethnic equity lens in both the uh, distribution and the use of the funds. And what we, I guess two things that I would also highlight that we heard, particularly from public sector interviews, um, was so many of um, the interviewees talked about using the funds for one-time investments. Um, or expansion of existing programs. And often this was with the idea of increasing the number of participants. Um, what was interesting to learn was that there was not necessarily a plan to use the funds to increase staffing um, or kind of with a long-term, long-range view of um, what uh, increasing participants today or over the next couple of years might look like um, once we hit a fiscal cliff moment. We also heard from uh, the public sector leaders in the interviews about potential opportunities for philanthropy to assist them as, as was talked about um, in the prior presentation. Um, and really looking, they were looking for help with program design, what were the evidence-based practices, grant making and grants management, 
evaluation and reporting um, was, was also lifted up as places they saw uniquely that they couldn't, they thought they couldn't use ARPA funds for or weren't intending to use ARPA funds for that they were interested in collaborating uh, with us around. From the Community Foundation peer interviews, what we heard were some common themes. Um, every, we were all kind of in the same place, as I'm sure many of you were and continue to be, about you know, understanding uh, what the, the distribution and impact for our own grant making plan, as well as um, you know, another common thing was almost everybody we interviewed, and this was, you know, nas uh, we had a national uh, pool of community foundations that we interviewed, almost all were uh, you know, looking to proactively use this as a moment to uh, reset and advance racial equity in the distribution and uh, the deployment of these funds. There was also concerns that were raised about um, kind of the, the lack of structures or guidance about how to kind of more have more centralized structures for planning and spending of the funds, the aggressive timelines, um, political influences that kind of were, uh, you know, causing folks to make very short term decisions um, and, and thinking, you know, trying to think about how to how to plan for more sustainability going forward. Um, as well as making sure that, again, that we were centering equity for uh, those who have been historically excluded from, from these types of funding, federal funding opportunities. So armed with this information, uh, we moved on to what we as community foundations do well, um, and um, glad to see the convening as, as one of the things that, were, that David lifted up. And, you know, we really, uh, we had a number of different opportunities to bring the information that we learned at, from the outset, we intended these documents to be open source documents. And um, we collaborated, collaborated with our regional uh, council on philanthropy to convene our philan uh, philanthropy throughout the state um, to not only learn about uh, what we had gathered as a result of the uh, research interviews, um, but to talk together about how we might collaborate around planning and funding and conversations with the public sector. Uh, we also convened our Connecticut Council of Municipalities, our mayors and our town managers along uh, to have this, a similar type of conversation um, about partnering with philanthropy. We will be hosting next month, actually, a public-private partnership summit um, with, the, with Governor Lamont and his executive agency leaders with statewide philanthropy to talk about um, you know, what has happened over the last you know, uh, year or so, what are some examples of good collaborative public-private partnership um, and how might we, we go forward. And finally, uh, the Hartford Foundation is a, uh, is a registered lobbyist. Um, so we really look to using our advocacy uh, capacity and strategic communication to, you know, whether it's uh, providing testimony during the legislative session, um, you know, and op-eds op um, and social media to ensure equitable and sustainable deployment of the ARPA funds. If we could move to the next slide. So this, I think in addition, um, what we also did with uh, this information um, and, and our ongoing conversations uh, with the public sector leaders is we really sought to the ways that we could fill gaps. Um, and again, I think for us, it really was with an eye to how can we support resilience and sustainability that this, you know, this was such a unique, unprecedented opportunity, but how do we not just see it as a two or three year moment? but really thinking beyond that um, as a community foundation, especially because we're designed to be here in per perpetuity. So thinking about that, again, you know, what were the ways that we could support efforts to monitor how and where the funds were being deployed, particularly with centering equity, um, so that um, those who were receiving the funds could capture the information about how the funds were being used and be well positioned to apply or you know, uh, receive funding, ongoing funding beyond the, the fiscal cliff moment. Um, we provided direct technical assistance and consultation um, to those more historically under-resourced and particularly the smaller, uh, more proximate nonprofit, by, BIPOC led and serving nonprofits to be able to, able to help them access ARPA dollars um, you know, through grant writers um, and other strategic planning technical assistance. Um, we increased our funding for community organizing and civic engagement work to lift up uh, and support the resident voice and nonprofit voice to talk about what the greatest community needs are, where funds could be deployed and how to think about doing that more equitably. We also in the state of Connecticut, uh, pre-ARPA, 
um, we passed legislation was passed related to racial ethnic impact statements for all to evaluate equity um, a proposed policy and budget uh, decisions and so we um, increased funding to to ensure uh, strong implementation of that particularly in this moment uh, with all of these the federal uh, dollars that we're streaming in um, and there's a link here to um, a very recent op-ed about the, the racial ethnic impact statement. And finally, um, we were providing funding to support nonprofits who were receiving the ARPA dollars to grow their own organizational diversity, equity, inclusion efforts to really kind of, again, to, to, to lift up the importance of um, equity uh, in the nonprofit ecosystem. Secondly, we also uh, look to support the nonprofits beyond program and project grant making. And um, this really was um, providing consultation and coaching and actual grant making dollars to support organizational stability. So things like technology grants um, for data and, and uh, evaluation systems, strategic planning, grant writing. Uh, we provided uh, funding to uh, in, uh, basically influence more collaboration and support for the data ecosystem, again, to be able to capture how the dollars were being used, what you know were impactful strategies to position our community to be able to apply for whether it's ongoing public funding beyond the ARPA um, or national funders. Um, and finally, we increased our uh, multi-year core support grant making to allow flexible dollars to cover operational costs that were not covered um, by ARPA. And then finally, we've been working with municipal and school district leaders to be creative in terms of like what we've seen is that many of them said to us, we have more money than we know what to do with almost. And I know that sounds crazy, but we did hear that over and over again, that, there's so, that they don't know where to spend it and not wanting to just kind of spend money uh, not thoughtfully. Um, so what ended up happening is folks were using uh, ARPA dollars and then found that they had surplus dollars or additional dollars that then didn't have to be used um, as they may uh, would have been used in, in other years. And so how to think about working with us to either hold those dollars in, in you know, donor advised funds that, uh, you know, could, could be allow a longer time horizon for planning um, and use beyond uh, the ARPA timeframe. So I'll stop there so that we can uh, have time for Marion and, and questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Marion. All right, give me a second here to share my screen. Okay, can everybody, I use multiple screens too, so I'm never sure if everybody's seeing my, my uh, slides correctly, so. Yep, and, we got them. Okay, awesome, okay, great. Well, it's great to hear, I'm so interested to hear about the, um, convening work and research work uh, that Alyssa just talked about um, and, and the, the broad impact that they were able to have in their area related to the ARPA dollars. I, I want to share an example um, of a, a community foundation serving as an administrator, going back to those kinds of roles that they that the Council on Nonprofits talked about earlier, funder, administrator, convener. We have served as an administrator of ARPA dollars. So that is what I'm going to share with you today. So let me tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, I, our foundation is the Parkersburg Area Community Foundation. We are located in um, Western West Virginia on the border with Ohio, um, with Southeastern Ohio. Um, we are a relatively modest uh, community foundation serving 11 count an 11 county region with about $80 million or so in assets. Maybe uh, we all know the market's been volatile lately, so those numbers are certainly jumping around these days. But um, that's a little bit about who we are and where we are. And um, I'm gonna first share the example of, of how we're serving as an administrator. And then I'm gonna share with you some lessons learned and some tips about how you might work with your local um, governments uh, related to these American Rescue Plan dollars. So. We have been allocated, we were allocated um, $525,000 um, in American Rescue Plan ARPA funds from the city of Parkersburg. Um, we are, that's the, our main, um, our main office is located in the city of Parkersburg. Um, and that program was in partnership with another local private foundation called the Bernard McDonough Foundation. And I'll get a little bit into in a minute about some of those relationships and how, how this worked this way. But I just want to tell you the details 
of the program first. So allocated $525,000, 500,000 of that to re-grant to nonprofits that were physically located in the city of Parkersburg, and then $25,000 to our foundation to assist with the administration of the program. So these funds were awarded in early spring of this year. And um, from that, we prepared um, guidelines and uh, process um, for nonprofits in our community to apply for these funds and issued a call for proposals. And we had conversations with the city about, um, of course, the kinds of things that are eligible through ARPA funding, but also some of the things that the city was interested in accomplishing and some of their priorities. They talked a lot about wanting to fund things that would be transformational for the city um, in terms of responding to needs, not just necessarily meeting the very most immediate needs. And also with a strong interest in the needs of youth and um, children um, as we looked um, towards the future for our community. So we did issue a call for proposals. We started with a letter of inquiry because we figured that we were gonna get quite a, a large response and we wanted to make the process as um, simple and friendly for the applicants as possible. So we started with a very uh, brief letter of inquiry so, we, so that we could initially screen those requests and um, only move forward the ones that we felt were most aligned. First of all, that met ARPA eligibility criteria, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, and also that were aligned with the intent of the program. Um, we put together a review committee that consists of representatives from um, the major local foundations, private community, and also our United Way. Um, our city was uh, really looking to the expertise of the foundations in terms of making these decisions. And so there is no one from the city who is serving on the review committee. And there's no final approval or run by the city. The, the funds were allocated to our foundation um, to distribute based on decisions that we would make on uh, based on our experience and our expertise um, working in the community. So um, we did advance a certain number. Of, we got for the $500,000 we had available, we got about $1.1 million in requests. Um, we invited a certain number of those to submit full proposals that were submitted on the 1st of August. We're currently under review. We had a review committee meeting last week, so we actually um, have our recommendations um, pretty much together, um, and uh, we'll be announcing those in the next couple of couple of weeks. Um, we're actually talking with our city about maybe some additional funding right now, um, so that may be a possibility. And um, after hearing the example of what was happening here in Parkersburg, um, the city of Wheeling, which is to our north in West Virginia, um, is replicating the program or doing similar work. I know Susie Nelson, my colleague with the Community Foundation for the Ohio Valley, is on the call today. I'm willing to connect with any of you who want to know more about what the city of Wheeling is doing. But I wanted to kind of pull back from that. So that's our specific program, but I wanted to talk about why, um, what role I think foundations and funders can play in terms of, of the working with their local governments uh, related to ARPA funds. I think that foundations have a unique role to exercise leadership on this topic because um, I know in at least in our community, our, uh, our foundation and other foundations have a strong reputation, um, a long history of supporting the needs in the community and being effective grant makers. So I think you can maximize that. And as a, as a community foundation or a private foundation, you can also go to the city and talk about the whole nonprofit sector rather than specific agencies going to say the city council trying to advocate for ARPA dollars. And I think that's a little bit of what happened with our city is that different nonprofits were coming to talk about different needs. And that became a little overwhelming for our city. They weren't experienced with um, responding to those kinds of requests or putting together an application process. So they turned to um, those in the community that have that expertise, the community foundation, the private foundations. Um, our mayor said, you know, if he had a, a leaky pipe, he wouldn't go fix it himself, he'd call the plumber. So if he wants to think about, and the city wants to think about supporting nonprofits in our community, they're gonna go to the experts and that's the, the fun funders and foundations in the region. I say it's important to ask, inquire, persist. So 
Um, we've had a long-term relationship and good um, partnership with our city on a number of projects. And so from the beginning, when we heard about the availability of these dollars, I started asking you know, and uh, inquiring uh, and reminding the city about the needs of nonprofits, advocating being a voice for the nonprofits and persisting in that. Um, and, you know, I think lower down here, I say smaller places can have easier access. We see people, we're a small community, so we might see the mayor out and about or see city council members out and about. And, and so in I use those opportunities to persistently and consistently um, advocate for the needs of nonprofits. And then eventually the city came to us and said, okay, you know, we'd like to talk about the needs of nonprofits and how can you help us? So build on relationships um, with your local representatives. If you don't have them, seek them out. Um, and I think in, you know, is for those of you who represent maybe smaller towns or rural places, I do think it's important to recognize that our local governments face many major infrastructure needs. And the dollars that some of our local governments are getting are just not that much. Um, I know in some of our rural counties that we serve, you know, they may be getting a couple of million dollars and they have huge needs around water and sewer. And it's important to recognize that while also still advocating for the needs of nonprofits that um, those needs are critical and those investments are important for the future of our communities as well. So let me wrap up just by talking about some lessons learned. And I say so far, because I keep learning and I'm sure I'll learn today. But um, if, if you're in a position to, to become an administrator of ARPA dollars, um, read the final rule carefully. That's the final rule issued by um, the treasury on the eligible uses of ARPA dollars. Um, it, it is really broad. So if your city or county or somebody is saying it's narrow, there's, there's a lot of um, opportunity there. Um, the, the funding that we're providing really, there are different buckets of ARPA uh, funds available. Um, ours really is kind of falling into two buckets, responding to the public health and economic impacts of COVID-19 and responding to negative economic impacts, which includes very specifically and distinctly assistance to nonprofits. And I'm not going to get into more detail there. You'd have to read the final rule, and I'd be happy to talk to somebody separately about all of that. Other than to say, there's also some things in the final rule about serving low to moderate income individuals and communities that we are, are paying close attention to. And then also, I would advocate or, or emphasize to read, there is a compliance um, document out there, which seems to be changing. I, I just saw that there, another version was issued in August, and the last one I had was June. And it's not always to easy to tell what changed in it, but it goes through very specifically what it means to be a subrecipient, which is what we are um, in this process. Um, the single audit requirement. We, you know, we've never handled these kinds of federal dollars before. But if you are expending more than three quarters of a million dollars in federal dollars in any given fiscal year, you have to do some additional. You have additional audit requirements. Um, there are some things in there related to procurement for your grantees. Um, our interpretation that was that our grantees had to register with SAM.gov. Again, I know I'm running out of time, so I won't go into real details on this. Um, there are requirements that you categorize the grants into uh, the certain categories that are in the final rule to show how they align with ARPA eligibility. And also, I would, if, you know, I would emphasize that you want to understand any reporting requirements required by your local government. Ours is being pretty open and flexible on that. I don't think we're going to have extensive reporting requirements, but I have been on other webinars and workshops where um, different community foundations or other foundations have talked about their local governments having pretty extensive reporting requirements. I'll stop there and so that we have time for questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Alyssa and Marion. Really interesting just how you all have uh, been working with this, these funds and uh, working with your colleagues. Um, do we, are there some questions that folks have um, they'd like to ask of the panel? Um, while, while people are thinking about that, maybe just to start with, Marion, I'm just curious with um, your uh, having gone through this experience, are you glad you, you've been doing it? Yes, yeah, yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been a little bit of a learning experience for us. Like I said, we haven't handled federal dollars in this way previously. 
but we are so excited that we were able to advocate and 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 see an allocation of these resources to help nonprofits in our community because um, we were you know concerned that the needs of nonprofits might be overlooked, and we knew that we could we could exercise leadership to make sure that they were not overlooked. And anything that you would have done differently now that you've gone through as much as you've gone through? I'm not sure there's anything I would do differently. We, we've been really fortunate because our city has been very flexible. They really saw working through the foundations also as a way to kind of separate the process, maybe from politics and, you know, just rely on the expertise of grant makers so that it didn't turn into um, the, you know, pe different city council members, for example, being lobbied to support certain things. We're a more neutral body, I would say. David, you got on mute. David, you're you're off mute. Did, did you want to add something oh, here? No, I just uh, I was telling you you were all you had gotten mute, muted. Well, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a Zoom call without you know trying to talk while you're on mute. So I'm glad I got that out of the way. Um, uh, does, does anybody on the panel want to add something at this point? I'd like to share that this is uh, Marion and Alyssa. Your your engagement is heart is thrilling from a nonprofit perspective. We, Tiffany and I, and our colleagues, do talk with folks all over the country and try to identify great examples. But both of you, both of your organizations, showed immense leadership of here's an opportunity. It could go terribly wrong, or it could be a wasted opportunity. And uh, Marion, particularly your comments about in a small community, you have a great opportunity. You you, you have some advantages of, of tracking the mayor down when he's at the, at the hardware store. Um, <laughs> and that's local problem solving. That's the community coming together. I know in Hartford, uh, the city has had significant economic challenges for a very long time. And it may have been easy. And perhaps you, you uh, are um, tempered in the fire of the challenges in Hartford. But the, the easy knee-jerk response from elected officials being, OK, good, this will solve those problems. And you engaged and you found the right, the better answers. And it's exciting. We, we relied on it heavily. We've reported on the, uh, uh, the Parkersburg community, uh, the, the news about Parkersburg. We share the information as best we can. Um, and the more we learn what you're doing, you, everyone on the call, the more, the better we can accelerate. For instance, uh, Wheeling is now copying Parkersburg and the whole world. Anyone who's read our report knows about uh, the Hartford Foundation work and so forth. We have the opportunity to accelerate the learning. So please do share. Keep share with David Cass, share with the Council of Foundations or anybody on the call or any, any of us on screen. And we're eager to spread the word. I would I would also add, I think, you know, while we've had a very good relationship with the city of Hartford's mayor um, and and uh, his team, you know, and, and prior administration as well with the community foundation, I think the ARPA uh, program really opened the door to a different kind of conversation and relationship, even beyond for us, because we serve the 29, uh, 29 town region. So we have different size uh, communities and it's really allowed us to have conversations with municipal leaders and school district superintendents that I, I think brought a relationship and an understanding of philanthropy, community foundations in particular, um, and, and ways that we can work together. And you know, I mentioned the summit that's that we're hosting uh, next, uh, next month and and you know really seeing that as as kind of a you know the next stage in, in in bringing these conversations about the ways that the public sector and philanthropy can and should be working uh in collabor collaboration that's terrific um well uh any quite uh, any questions that folks want to ask of the panelists or or even just to share about your own experience in working with uh, the, these funds. We just have a couple of minutes left. While people are thinking, I just wanted to highlight the one quote that really struck me, which was the, the comment that Marianne said that's, I don't call, you know, I'm not going to fix it myself. I'm going to call the plumber, right? Like, I think that that is lost a lot 
of times in the nonprofit sector that we are actually the experts in how to get things done in communities. And as Alyssa was just saying, like this is our opportunity to expand that and really build on those relationships to be able to really let the lay the groundwork for the future. Because we know that things are going to keep happening, right? Like we have a lot of disasters happening right now. We have a lot of um, events that if we can build those relationships now, we'll all be set up a lot better for the future. But we also know that the same thing doesn't, like one thing doesn't fit to every community. A, something that's working in a small town doesn't necessarily work for a huge city and vice versa, but you can take the lessons learned, which were shown by Marianne and Alyssa, and that we have in our report that we can then expand upon so that in next year, in five years, we're in such a better position. I, I couldn't agree point. more. And I think I think the focus, having a focus on the resiliency and the uh, capacities of the nonprofits that are on the front line doing this work it, it can, also, it can also be lost in this, that it's not just about programs and services that benefit individual residents, but we need strong, resilient nonprofits and coming out of COVID, you know, we, we you know, hold those lessons and, and how, the, how do we seize this moment to, you know, set that stage as well. Yeah, and just quickly related to that, just, I mean, the majority of our grants are going to be uh, general operating support um, grants. Um, we do are do, going to do some capital things too that are kind of pandemic related response in terms of improving ventilation and some things like that. But the, the vast majority is operating to build that, to give the flexibility to those nonprofits to, you know, deploy those resources in the best way that they know how, they know how to best deploy them to build their resiliency and to, to um, build their capacity, so. Great. Um, well, any uh, any last comments from anyone on the panel? Anything else you want to add? On behalf of the entire broad nonprofit charitable nonprofit community, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marion and Alyssa, for what you're actually doing hand in, on the ground. Thank you, David and Caroline, for uh, coordinating. But to everyone watching, we need your help. Frontline charitable nonprofits are suffering all the challenges that you hear every day. Both both of our um, uh, community foundation colleagues uh, commented that the reaction from politicians was, we don't know where to start. There are people coming, co coming to us. We charitable nonprofits have great ideas of how they could spend their money. And it took the convening power of the community foundations as the honest broker to uh, get things get things done. We are, we charitable nonprofits are one of several thousand uh, people with the hands out or the great ideas of how to spend it. With the help, with the coordination, with the expertise of the community foundations, we're able to target and, and actually focus on solutions in the community. That's what we charitable nonprofits are seeking to do and working together in partnership with the municipal municipalities is to turn the promise of the uh, of the ARPA into the positive reality. So this is exciting. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's a, a great place to close. Um, thank you to our panelists. I really appreciate your time. I hope this has been useful to everyone. Uh, if you have additional questions, please follow up with, with us or National Council of Nonprofits or, or our panelists. And uh, uh, Carolyn, anything else we need before we close? No, no, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you to our panelists and all of the attendees. The recording will be in your inbox by the end of the week.